Good evening. My name is Antonio Ries, and I'm the chairman of the Spanish Society of Madrid. It's my privilege today to welcome the participants of this webinar representing different European scientific societies. Our intention with this webinar is to share different criteria and maybe generate a common guideline that may be useful to embryologists of our societies. Our feeling from different webinars we have collaborated in Spain is that the embryologists are demanding more details on how to approach this new scenario with SARS-CoV-2, focusing on the laboratory issues. I think that this may be a great chance to strengthen these relations between our societies and serve as a base for future collaborations. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Nicolas Prados, coordinator of the working group of COVID-19 of Acevir, Ana Veiga, coordinator of the working group of COVID-19 of the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology, Jason Kerry, of chairman of the British Society of Reproductive and Clinical Scientists, Lucia De Santis, chairwoman of the Italian Society of Embryology, Reproduction and Research, Sofia Nunes, chairwoman of Embryology Section of the Portuguese Society of Reproductive Medicine, and Mark Grossman, vice chairman of Asevier and moderator of the session. Dr. Grossman. Thanks, Antonio. Good evening to everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar that has been organized by Asevier. There are more than 500 registered participants which is such a success, and we are happy to do so. I'll give you some instructions on how this webinar is going to work, some principalities. There is the possibility of sending questions or comments at whatever time. We encourage all of you to send your comments, and the speakers will answer them at the end. Please make short questions or short comments. So we will be able to, to, to so we will have the opportunity to, man, to to answer many more of them. If your question is addressed to a particular to a specific speaker, please state it clearly. And finally, if you are not able to answer all questions due to limited time, the remaining questions will be summarized, answered, and posted in the uh, uh, a severe website in a few days. Finally, there will be a certificate of, of attendance delivered also in a few days. Unfortunately, we can contact with Dr. Cisantis from Italy right now. We hope to do so shortly so we can tell, her, tell so she can tell us the Italian point of view. As Antonio said, the aim of this session is to share criteria on how to deal with SARS-CoV-2, even knowing that the knowledge about the pandemic is limited and constantly evolving, and with the particularity that each country has its own laws and each country has different ways of dealing with it. It is obviously a strong difficulty in our work. Anyway, first speaker is Dr. Nicolas Prados, coordinator of the working group on COVID-19 of Asevir, who's going to explain us the highlights of our protocol. Hello, Nicolas. Hope you are ready. So the, the audience is yours. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. So I'm going to share now my slides. Okay, so so good afternoon. So I'm going to explain a little first about the Spanish document that we have made, uh, as a severe, the Spanish Embryologists Association and the Spanish Fertility Society. Uh, this is a dynamic uh, document. We are we have already published a couple of 
versions, the 20th of April, the first one, the 4th of May, the second one. And next week, we're going to, this week we are reviewing and next week we will publish the third version. Uh, hopefully, uh, at some point, it will disappear. This is a, a document for this time of pandemic. This document we have made in Spain has different chapters, different parts. I'm going to focus on the part about the, about the laboratory, about the ART laboratory. Uh, we talk about the management of the patients and donors previous and during the treatments, their biosafety recommendations for the laboratory during the pandemic, safety measures for the staff, information for patients during the pregnancy, and some uh, and the annexes were just a summary of the assisted reproductive technology risk associated with this coronavirus, an informative consent, a specific consent for the patient during this pandemic, an example of a questionnaire for the triage, and the guide for the laboratory. And finally, an example of a patient triage, an algorithm. So it is a complex and dynamic scenario. Right now we have a, we don't know everything about SARS-CoV-2. We know many things, but we don't know everything. And we are in a strange situation where we are getting a plenty of information, but plenty of information is, there are just case reports, many of them without peer review, with sometimes missing information and very low number of cases. So from one week to another week, the scenarios change and things we think it was one way, now it's a different one. So most probably in a couple of months, we will be able to distinguish the, the good information with the bad information, but right now we have to work with everything. So sometimes we, we may take two too many preventive measures, but better safe. So also the incidence of the pandemic is different in different regions and different countries. And uh, thankfully it's lowering. There will be risk of outbreaks and in, in other countries, in other continents, right now it's increasing the incidence, but in Europe, the Philip, it's, it's lowering the incidence, but we are in a risk of outbreaks. Uh, we are using uh, uh, tests for, for testing the patients to know their, their status, but they are very, very variable. Some of them have limited values, uh, quick tests. Some of them give a high number of false negatives depending on the scenario. Or even the PCR, if, if you don't take the swab properly, can give you false negatives. And the main thing is that COVID-19 it's not a chronic disease. It's, it's, it's curable. You know, my, most people that suffer it, they, they get back on their feet, but it's extremely contagious. That's the main problem. So uh, it's difficult to keep the people who are more sens uh, sensitive to this disease to avoid the contact. So that, this would be the most important thing about this, this pandemic. In the laboratory, there is no universal standard procedure. And that's something that we are, we, we are, that idea is getting clearer and clearer. Each unit must have a documented risk assessment of the, of the, uh, of its biosafety and make a code of conduct of a biosafety procedure. Okay, where you explain your measures and why you are taking them. Not only during the pandemic, that would be a specific pro procedure, SOP, but at any point, just to prevent any, any, any infectious disease. Usually the main reference for all this is the, the World Health Organization Biosa Biosafety Manual, which is in its third edition from 2004, 2005, the Spanish version. The fourth draft has been already redacted. I'm going to the next slide, I'm going to talk about a little bit about it. We have also European directives, explains the different biological agents and the measures we we'll have to take. We have the X-ray guidelines for good practice in the lab. We have uh, national guidelines like the severe guideline for human and physical resources in the lab. With all these, you must make your own SOPs and what is important, you must document 
why your safety measures are being taken with a documented risk assessment. Uh, human coronavirus type, uh, uh, human coronavirus, the standard one, the one that makes us the cold uh, disease in winter time, it's a type two biological agent. SARS CoV, the one, the pandemic of some years ago, is classified as a type three biological agent. In some countries, SARS-CoV-2 has been provisionally classified also as a class three uh, agent. The important thing, what would the focus is, we must keep the safety, safety of, of our patients, the future newborn, the samples, the specimens, and the embryologists, our staff. If we're talking about a type three biological agent, do we have do I have to work now in a type three containment laboratory? The answer is no. You have to work in one if you're culturing the biological agent, you're concentrating it, you're working with samples from, you're making a vaccine and using cell culture and testing how the, the agent is spreading. In the fourth edition, there is a trend and it's going to come in this fourth edition of the WHO biosafety manual, the important thing is the risk assessment. It's not that strict on the technology you have to use, but you have must make a, a balance between the risk and the safety, the benefits and the cost of all the different measures in a, sensi in a sensible way. We are, we are transplant laboratories. We work with human tissues and samples and we must always work with them as potentially hazardous material. So that's why we are already working in group two containment laboratories. We are not working in a group one. We are not working with things that are always unlikely to cause a human disease. Uh, if our healthy patients can be always, uh, they can be always carrying some infectious disease that have been tested for or they are, have just uh, been contagious. Um, we also have already experience of working with HIV or HCV infected patients. So we have uh, already experience. So the bottom line is that for standard patients, we don't have to and take... We don't have to take any special, uh, 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 we don't have to make any change to our standard procedures. There are enough for handling samples that may be infected as with any other uh, infectious disorder. A different scenario is we are working with patients which are positive for the symptoms with the COVID-19 disease or for the virus, for the SARS-CoV-2. So some modifications we may observe. So the, the main difference is not because of the samples, but because of the pandemic and how contagious it is. So talking about the safety of the laboratory staff, we must, uh, be, we must be as strict with the prote personal protective equipment and safety rules. We must always follow the national guidelines. And everybody in the clinic, there must be a general SOP, but also a detailed one per professional category. Everyone, everybody must know what, uh, what protective equipment they must wear, how to put it on, how to safely take it off, how to, uh, when to throw it away, when to take a new one, whatever. The goal is to avoid this, to spread uh, the spread caused by people who are asymptomatic, but they are infected. The only change to the standard procedures that we have introduced is the use of gloves, and I put here an asterisk, and surgical mask at all time inside the laboratory. Why? Because sometimes at some point it's difficult to avoid the general two meter rule distance uh, when you are working in a lab. The gloves has an asterisk that initially we thought that gloves should be also wear at all times, but at some point we are discussing something that it may arrive in the third edition or not, that just with uh, washing your hands and cleaning your workstation between procedures would be enough and with, you don't need to use gloves because the risk of mishandling a sample uh, could be higher. 
Of course, all the standard rules apply. Correct clothing, no use of personal phone or items, no mouth pipetting, correct disposal of waste. So very little difference to what we've been, the way we've been working up to now. Big question, should the laboratory staff be tested? We didn't say specifically yes in the document. We said that it's a risk assessment of each unit. Some units can decide to do it. Some units may decide not to. Important thing, daily triage always. If you have symptoms, don't go to work. Why we thought that there were some risk that each clinic must assess in this risk assessment, which are the validity and the availability of the test. Uh, maybe in some places they are not available, but if they're available, not all tests are the same, and there could be false negatives, or maybe they are not good enough to detect asymptomatic people till 15 days after the first exposure. It could give way to unfair hiring. So when maybe you are hiring uh, exposed people who already have passed the disease instead of people who has not been exposed yet. And the privacy of results, even with HIV, you, you take the test, but it's your right to make it known or not the, the result of the test. The important thing is that, is that it can give the staff, the embryologists in the, in the lab, a false security that because we are tested, we can relax the rules of wearing the surgical mask or washing your hands or whatever. It's a very contagious disease. The important thing is to wear always your personal protective equipment and obey your rules. It's not being tested or not. So that's something to take into account. And the same with the working in shifts. Should we will be working in shifts till the pandemic ends? In, the, in our document, we said that it's something to take into consideration during the peaks of the pandemic or if there is an, uh, an outbreak. Why? Because we are, uh, the lab is not living in the lab as a family in their household uh, where we are not wearing uh, PPEs. We're wearing PPEs, we're uh, being strict, we don't want the disorder, to the disease to, to get to one to another embryologist. If we start working in shifts and people again, with this false security thinks that that's enough, people may relax the safety measures and you will have an outbreak, a local outbreak in your lab. The important thing, again, are the PPEs, the protective measures, not the, it's, not, it's important to work in shifts, yes, but more important is the safety measures you take to avoid the, the infection. Another issue that people ask us a lot that are severe and that we reflected in our document and maybe we expand it in ne the next version or not, is the dis disinfection after the, the standard procedures. We're not talking about the patients who are infected, but just any standard patient during this pandemic. Should we disinfect everything after each procedure, after each denudation, after each retrieval in the lab, after each ICSI. So that's a risk assessment of sanitation versus disinfection. And I put here three different levels of, of cleanliness. You sanitize, and when you, yeah, you take measures for cleaning and protecting health, it's a general thing. That's usually just using some detergent or just uh, using some kind of wipe. If you're disinfecting, you're removing the presence of disease germs, most of them, sometimes not all of them, but you're removing the disease germs. And you talk about a sterilization when you remove all forms of life, but there are different levels of, of cleanliness. We think that in a minimal risk scenario for patients who are not tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, sanitation or a low-key disinfection may be enough. Why? Because there's nothing perfect. In this table, I just put the most common things that we use in the lab for sanitizing or disinfecting. Uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide, that's perfect. That's the strongest one. 
it's not volatile. It changes into water and oxygen. It's perfect, but it's extremely corrosive. It's, a, it's toxic for, for humans. So it's not nice to use it after each uh, procedure. The same with bleach, with hypochlorite. It's the same. It disinfects a lot, but it's very corrosive. If you sit every day, 25, 30 times inside your lab, in two weeks' time, you will start having rust everywhere in plastic and the stain, even in the stainless steel. So it's not nice things to use continuously all the time. We can use ethanol, the classic one, but it's a, a volatile organic compound, so it's not that nice to have a cloud of ethanol in your lab because you've been uh, disinfecting everything after each procedure. We can go to ammonium quaternary products. Those are nice. They say they are embryo friendly, but we must know it's a low key disinfection. There are many germs. It, it, it kills coronavirus, but there are many germs that they are not killed by this ammonium quaternary. It's not volatile, but it needs five to 15 minutes to work. So if you are cleaning and disinfecting your workstation, you must wait your five, 15 minutes to work again with the next patient. So it's not perfect. You must wait between procedures. Or you can use just water with soap, which it kills coronavirus. It is a low E disinfection, lower than the ammonium quaternary, but kills many germs. It's not volatile, but you must say in your procedure that you are sanitizing. You cannot say that you are disinfecting if you are only using a detergent. So in the end, it's a balance between a very good disinfection or a sanitation. You know, from our point of view, this, what the standard procedure before the pandemic was focusing in using only detergents or uh, quaternary ammonium, if this time is, uh, you know, one can afford to spend five minutes between one and other procedure, and not going to these more extreme ways of disinfecting the lab between each procedure. Do we have to change anything about the, clim the climatization, the HPAC system? No, we must maintain our positive pressure, and probably avoid low temperatures just in case we get a standard cold that could help spread uh, a COVID-19 outbreak. But we really do not need to make any change. What we are going maybe to introduce in our next uh, version of the document is that because of all these available tests, now we have like three different group of patients. Patients with a minimal risk of being infected, which they, are, they have a positive, a negative uh, SARS-CoV-2 test, immunological, immunological an, an antibody test or a PCR test. Of course, there could be false negatives, window period, so it's not a 100% uh, SARS-free uh, patients. A low risk patients are those that have only undergone a negative triage. They haven't undergone any test at all. So most of them will be free of the virus, but there may be some asymptomatic infected patients. And of course, the high risk, which are the, the patients which uh, have been positive, tested positive for, for, for this test. A uh, no-risk scenario doesn't sit. There's always the possibility of false negatives. We are always working with human samples, so there may be always hazards. And uh, safety measures must be always in place. The literature, because of these non-peer uh, case reports, is not clear 100%. It may be present in testicle and ejaculate of people who has been infected. But there are more articles in press. Uh, there is a case from China two weeks ago. It had plenty of headline, news headlines. But uh, now there's starting to be more communication case support that this is not the case. They have, we are not finding 
this in, in other infected males, but we don't know yet for sure, maybe present. We haven't found it yet, and there's no case report in follicular fluid or, or in OSA. This is independent of the presence of the receptors. To have the receptors doesn't mean that it's a, a tissue target for this virus. So this would be just a quick summary of the measures in the lab that we can take in these three scenarios. Right now, for manipulation of samples in the laboratory, minimal risk patients, low risk patients, we have more or less the same, the same procedures, which are the same standard procedures we've been using up to now. A different issue is that maybe this pandemic is reminding us of the good practice in the lab that maybe we haven't kept up, kept up with. So if we are working with direct human tissues like this, like the semen, the ejaculate, or ovarian tissue or testicular tissue, if there is a risk of generating aerosols or spillage, we should use a biosafety cabinet grade two and safety caps for the centrifuge. If they are not available, then we should use safety goggles, uh, the FFP2 or N95 mask, if they are uh, not available, and sanitation after each procedure. If we are looking, working with follicular fluid, because it's more rare to find heated uh, biosafety cabinets and the risk of impairing these, the, the all sites, then uh, we should use the mask and safety glasses if they are not <clears throat> available. Again, it's more or less the same. Uh, if the, our standard patients, we are using the sperm once it's washed, commonly oocyte embryos, because it's a washed sample, we have diluted the possibility, very low, rare, even it's not uh, a possibility of having some viral particle, we consider that using gloves, surgical mask, a standard flow cabinets and sanitation after procedure is enough for the safety of the embryologist, the samples, and the patients. A different scenario is a positive, after a positive triage or a positive test. Theoretically, most algorithms uh, tell us that they shouldn't be treated for an ART cycle, but at some point, it, because uh, it's a decision between the patient, the clinics, the gynecologist, the laboratory. At some point, you may treat a patient, which is possible. In that case, it's something similar to an HIV, HCV positive patient. You should wear gloves, the uh, N95 masks. You should use the bio biological safety cabinets and the safety caps in the centrifuge. Temporal isolation, don't do at the same time, the lab, different uh, patients with or without uh, uh, these patients with other patients, and make a disinfection after the procedure. The same, more or less, for the same for the follicular fluid. And uh, once it's diluted, it's a little safer to work with uh, cumuleocyte embryos of these patients. So it will be independent incubator, although nowadays all patients are in independent incubators and disinfection after procedure. Just a quick uh, reminder that horizontal flow cabinets are not safe for manipulation of human samples. They should not be used at all for the manipulation of ejaculate ovarian tissue, testicular tissue, or ovarian fluid. Vertical flow cabinets are not biological safety cabinets, but they may be used in, in this scenario because we are using washed, uh, diluted uh, samples, and it's safer because they are heated for the, for the, for the specimens. There's the same analysis for uh, if we are going to, to cryopreserve these, these tissues. If they have been given negative, we can use standard procedures, but in this case, because of the higher incidence of asymptomatic people in the low risk, and because we are going to store these samples with other patients, we feel, and this is a, something that we're going to introduce, maybe not exactly this way in the next version, we feel that we should take some extra measures of safety 
uh, with people who are only negative triage, distinguishing from the uh, patients who have given negative. And the recommendation of in case of ejaculate, always use uh, the the safety the safety straws. Of course, if you are using testicular ovarian issue, there are no closed uh, devices available for them. Maybe the Crioflex. So you should always use an isolated tank or a vapor phase tank. So uh, this is, may change. Maybe in three weeks the incidence is so low that all these measures for high risk patients disappear. Maybe we we keep them as another uh, another serology, another. Uh, triage of patients till for the next six months, one year, uh, who knows? This is changing every week, every day with new information. Anyway, uh, at least we must, if this is more or less the scenario, the things that we think uh, we should introduce, introduce knowing that for standard patients, healthy patients, that they, are, they have symptoms or they test uh, uh, negative for COVID-19, we don't have to do anything extra. A different issue is the clinic, how you move the patient through the clinic, how you, how you move, how the staff move around the clinic and all that kind of things that they must have must extra protocols, specific procedures for that. But what's the, the work inside the laboratory? We feel that very little changes we must do because we are already working in a level two safety laboratory, so so we are safe and the samples are safe. So thank you very much. I think the, I want to stop here and I I pass my the video to Mark. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you. At the end, it's not so difficult, isn't it? No, it's not. <laughs> Okay. As a uh, question will be made at the end, next speaker, Jana Vega, coordinator of the work, working group of COVID-19 of the ESRE. Anna uh, is, explain, is going to explain us the point of view of ESRE. I, I think in the ESRE document, the ESRE document doesn't, uh, doesn't go in deep about modifications in IVF lab protocols. Maybe because it's so complicated considering the differences between each countries. Will be updates, Anna, of this document? Well, the audience is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction and thank you um, to the organizers for inviting me uh, to this webinar. It's always a pleasure to, to be part of uh, our severe uh, work. Uh, what I'm going to present is uh, the Azure point of view with regards to the IVF guidelines, not especially for the IVF laboratory because we have not gone into the detail of the uh, ASEBIR guidelines, but certain things uh, would need to be discussed and uh, it would be a pleasure for me to, to share them with you. First thing, and this will be very fast, this is the uh, Azure COVID working group, a number of uh, different people, sorry. I'm sorry, I cannot see now this, just a second. Can you see my presentation? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can see, the, we see the presentation, the second slide. But the problem is that I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> just a second, let me see. Ah. It's here. Okay, sorry for that. This is um, these are the members of the of the COVID nineteen Asia working group. As you can see, there are people from different countries, embryologists and clinicians. We have a number of different activities that have been uh, going on. You have here the, the website, the link to the website where you can find all this information. And uh, my point is that. Um, Summarizing what we have done, we have produced a number of guidance documents. We started quite soon 
with an address statement uh, that was only um, involving COVID-19 patients. We said that they should avoid becoming pregnant at that time. This was end of February. Then we moved on to uh, recommend that all fertility patients should avoid becoming pregnant. This was in the middle of March. And then um, this final statement that we produced, uh, and this was um, in the week 14 of the, of the pandemic, and this was on the 2nd of April, where we said that ESHRE advised that ART should not be started for a number of reasons that you have here listed in my slide. In any case, we said that there was an exception for urgent fertility preservation that should be uh, done in any case, because in those cases, the patients uh, had the risk to become infertile and could not wait until the pandemic, the pandemic was over. Later on, and this was on the 23rd of April, we produced a guidance document on recommencing ART treatments uh, and being aware that the risks um, of infection were decreasing, ART treatments could be restarted for any clinical indication uh, in line with local regulations all the time. Other activities that our working group has been doing is we have put in place a picture of Europe, a number of uh, dynamic maps showing how um, all the centers in different countries or some centers in different countries countries stop their activity and how they restarted. You can find this in the, in the website, of course. And um, what um, we used uh, as an information to produce these maps were a questionnaire to the Committee of National Representatives. And here, again, I take the opportunity to thank all these professionals in the different countries that provided with the information regarding uh, ART activity at different time points. Another important thing, and, and here again, I, I take the opportunity to, to, to promote this, is that we want to collect data on COVID-19 um, positive women that achieve a pregnancy. A survey has been sent to all ESRE members uh, where we try to collect all this information. There is information regarding the, um, the last part of the pregnancy and the delivery, but unfortunately we do not have any data regarding what happens if uh, a patient gets pregnant when she's COVID positive or if she gets uh, the virus, she gets infected once the pregnancy in, in its very early stages. This is important information, and I would um, ask all of you who are listening that if you have such pregnancies, please go to our website and try to find this, uh, this survey to try to, to report these cases. Also, we have a section on questions and suggestions from professionals and from patients. Um, our labs and our centers need to adapt to this new situation. Of course, the first thing to do is that you have to educate and train your staff and also the patient to move into the center, how to behave, how to keep the social distancing. We have to have protective screens in all places where you can install them. Social distancing is all obviously uh, compulsory, sanitation, as it has been mentioned, PPE availability. Uh, we have to separate high-risk patients, especially the ones that are urgent and, and, and we need to treat. And the final goal is to, um, to, to avoid exposure to, to people that are infected, and this can be achieved uh, through a shift work in the cases where this is needed, and um, promotion of telemedicine uh, with regards to consultations, to consent, advice, and prescription is also highly recommended. Uh, here you see, and I will, I will not go into detail, but how to adapt ART services uh, at this time, at the time of, of the pandemic, the general rule, social distancing, sanitation, separate pathway, and respect triage rules affects all steps of what we do in, in an ART center. Obviously, during stimulation monitoring, obviously, during or site retrieval, uh, we give a, a, a big um, importance to the triage, the triage, and if available, the tests that we can perform both to patients and to staff um, uh, can make you take decisions. 
in the lab, it has al already been said that the way we work in the lab by using very high dilution system when transporting our oocytes uh, and embryos into the different dishes is a kind of guarantee that even if there is uh, uh, some viral load into the those fluids, it is so diluted that probably it will not cause any, any problem. The same thing about freezing, I will go into a little bit more of the, the detail on, on that, but again, uh, not much uh, changes uh, in the methodology that we are using uh, in the lab. Sorry. Okay. Uh, why do we need to be very careful? What do what do we have? Why do we have to change things in the lab, or why do we have a real need for vigilance? We don't know much, and this has already been said about the infection of reproductive tissues and cells. We don't know clearly if SARS-CoV-2 can attach and enter reproductive uh, cells. We don't know really if vertical transmissions from, from, from the mother to the fetus in the case of a COVID positive patient um, occurs. And we don't know either if pregnant women are a higher risk of infection or mobility. Here you have a kind of summary of um, different publications that have uh, been reported and have appeared quite recently. You, you see that all the references are from 2020, or most of them, um, with regards to the uh, evidence of viral presence in sperm samples. As it has been said, there are papers that say that no virus, no vi virus has been found in, in the ejaculate, while others say that this is not the case, and uh, the virus has been demonstrated in, in some of the patients, both ill patients and patients who are recovering. No evidence in oocytes, even though uh, the expression level of AC2, which is the receptor for the virus, virus or one of the receptors, is relatively high. In embryos, and again, um, um, some of the papers that are referred here are, are not peer-reviewed papers. They are papers that have come in, in journals that, that do not follow um, the peer review system, but it seems that embryos at different stages can have AC receptors uh, expressed and also the machinery to try, uh, the machinery to replicate the virus is also present in some embryos. Again, uh, in a variant tissue, we have a, a, here a, a reference which is from 2011. Uh, in which they show that AC2 is expressed in the human ovary. And in the placenta, you have a high expression of this receptor, even though, again, uh, as I said, logical transmission has not uh, always uh, been demonstrated and it's not really uh, something that we can conclude. With regards to the uh, methodology, I will not go into the detail about this. Um, you have to update your SOPs for the protection of samples and protection of staff. You have to use adequate protocols for disinfection. And obviously, if you had stopped your activity, ART laboratories might get prepared one week before the starting of the activity with patients and samples. Everything has to be put in place regarding both cleaning and disinfection and also the equipment. As a general rule, uh, our proposal is that no COVID-19 positive patients should be allowed to proceed diagnostic procedures or ART treatment based on adequate triage and testing. It has, it has already been said that tests are not always available everywhere. And also the um, reliability of these tests is quite variable. So we have to take all these things in, into account. In any case, Every lab has to work under um, the usual methodology. And here you have an example of such methodology. These are the revised guidelines for good practice in IVF laboratories that we produced or we revised in, in 2015. Um, not, not going again into much detail about that because this has already been said and it's exactly the same. Fertility preservation, uh, we recommended that this has had to be kept as an activity even uh, at the highest levels of the pandemic. We need to use similar culture and freezing protocols in sample from COVID positive um, uh, patients like the ones that we use uh, 
that are infected with other viruses. Uh, again, high security stores, nitrogen vapor storage and separate storage is recommended when you demonstrate that that patient is a COVID positive patient. But um, apart from that, we have to say that there are no reports on SARS-CoV-2 uh, and cryopreservation and storage. And it seems that following good clinical and laboratory practice is safe enough to deal with uh, such, uh, such samples if, if needed. Um, what about the vertical transmission, the interuterine transmission? Again, little information is, is available. Most of it comes from, from China, uh, obviously. Uh, the number of cases and the time at, at which the, the pandemic uh, initiated there allows those people to, to, to collect those data. Uh, it seems that there are reports of infants that show uh, the, the disease soon after the delivery. Uh, only in, in one case, it seems that maybe a vertical transmission was, um, was a possibility, even though not heavily demonstrated. And at this time, no convincing evidence for vertical transmission has been demonstrated as it was not demonstrated or shown for SARS and MERS uh, either. So um, uh, another thing that we need to take into account, and this, this has already been said, is that th this virus is, is ex extremely contagious. So the number of people that get the infection is really high. You, have here a uh, you can see here a comparison between SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. The number of pregnant women that have been assessed the gestational age at presentation, as you can see, most of the cases of COVID-19 reported are at the end of the pregnancy. Uh, not a high number of them were admitted to ICU. Um, very few of them died, but in certain cases, you could see from these reports, obstetric, obstetric and neonatal complications with regards to um, uh, miscarriage, intrauterine growth, uh, retardation, preterm delivery, and the neonatal death. But as, as I said, data are really very limited, and we have to take this uh, into account. Um, as a conclusion of, of this, uh, I would say that SARS-CoV-2 may have the potential to infect reproductive tissues and cells. Vertical transmission has not been shown. We do not have information on what happens if a, a COVID positive patient um, gets pregnant uh, or if, uh, if a, a positive, um, if a patient submitted to ART gets uh, the infection uh, later on. Pregnant women do not seem to be under higher risk of infection of COVID-19 related morbidity and obstetric set outcomes seem to be better than with SARS and with MERS uh, infections. Again, uh, a reminder that it's very important that we get information on what are the consequences of this infection early in pregnancy. And I would um, promote uh, you to uh, submit these data on COVID-19 pregnancies, go to the website uh, and, and try to fill in uh, this, this survey so we can get all, the, all this information. And uh, as an end to my presentation, you can hear some references regarding uh, the information that I have shown in my presentation. And uh, just to finish, uh, let me tell you that during our Asia virtual 36 annual meeting that will take place between the 5th and the 8th of July, uh, online, obviously, during the opening ceremony, we will have a lecture, an opening lecture entitled Update on COVID-19 by uh, a Spanish virologist uh, called Dr. Buenaventura Clotet. And also we will have one session or probably two, session, uh, two sessions of COVID uh, oral communications. We have uh, made a call to try to collect uh, all the possible abstracts that people wanted to submit to have a session on this important uh, area of, of, of knowledge that is uh, obviously um, the effects of uh, COVID-19 in, in ART patients and in fertile patients. So that was it. I uh, thank you for your attention. And I will be happy to answer questions if there are any. 
Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Nice presentations. Next speaker is Dr. Jason Geisrey, Chairman of the Association of Reproductive and Clinical Scientists of the United Kingdom. Uh, we, we ask Dr. Geisrey um, to talk about the British point of view or about or in front of COVID-19. So, dear doctor, how this pandemic changed the day-to-day -day work in British IBF labs? The audience is for you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you to Asabir for the invitation to take part in the webinar today. I thought I'd begin by discussing the history of our response in the UK, because it does feel a little bit like we were slightly behind some of the European countries in our response. Um, and, and that's an issue of some debate in the UK at the moment, particularly, partic particularly politically. Um, what happened uh, with our two societies, because there are two main societies in the UK, there's the Association of Reproductive and Clinical Scientists, which represents the scientific community, and the British Fertility Society, which represents the, the medical and primarily nursing community. And um, we worked together very closely. On the 16th of March, we released a joint statement uh, to our members, stating that our members should be careful and should consider risk assessments and slowing treatments, et cetera. And I think it's testament to the speed with which COVID moved in the UK or appeared to move that two days later on the 18th of March, we released guidance informing clinics that they should cease all, all non-urgent treatments and advise that we should only really allow for, for treatments of oncology patients, patients who are coming through for fertility preservation work. Um, now it's important to note also that in the UK, the majority of treatments are are private, around about 60% of, of treatments are paid for by patients themselves. And around about 40% are funded on our national health service, so they're funded by the government. But the majority of centres in the UK are actually national health service centres. And that had a big impact upon us because what happened was in our national health service centres, a lot of our staff were told that they would be redeployed to help in the fight against COVID-19. And so at the time that we were advising centres that they should be closing, some NHS centres, some of our national health service centres, were having to close anyway because their doctors, their nurses and even their scientists were being pulled away to their activities. And even some clinics in the UK were even converted for bed space. Um, so the 18th of March was the ARCS BFS joint guideline um, or joint statement that advised closure of all clinics. And then we have a governing body in, in the UK, the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority. And the governing body released a, what they call a general direction on the 23rd of March. And that direction advised that all clinics should immediately work to close and that all treatments should stop by the 15th of April at the very, very latest. Um, and they also stated, they gave us four conditions under which they thought that the UK could reopen for treatments. And those four conditions were that the government itself would, would lift restrictions on social contact and travel, that the restarting of fertility treatments, and this was particularly important for us, I, I think, as well as it is for everybody, but that we were worried about the impact of restarting fertility treatments on the rest of the health service, particularly with regard to the availability of, of personal protective equipment and staff as well. Um, we also wanted to know that there would be no ongoing evidence of the impact of COVID-19 on, on, on pregnant women and their babies. So it was interesting to hear Anna's presentation there. Um, we still have a dearth of information available on, on the impact on pregnancy and, and, on, and on babies. And, and what the HFEA stated was that provided that remained the case, then we could potentially offer treatments in the future. And point four was that obviously that we could offer safe service. So only two weeks after we ceased treatments in the UK, so all treatments finished on the 15th of April, the ARCS and BFS COVID working group, which we'd convened, and that was a working group that consisted, it was cross-disciplinary, so it was doctors, medical doctors, scientists, nurses, and patient representatives um, convened, and we addressed what the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority had said should be addressed and, and and we decided as a group that we felt that it was probably time for clinics to be able to offer some treatments again and on the same day in quick succession the hfea released a uh, 
an update to their general direction, which allowed centres to apply to reopen for treatments from the beginning of May. And it was on the 11th of May that we were allowed to apply to them to be able to treat patients again. And then interestingly, on national television, our health secretary, who's the most senior member of government dealing with, with health, announced on national television on the 1st of May that fertility clinics were reopening. And, and then that, that same day and the rest of that evening, the phone call, phones were just ringing all the time, patients desperately wanted to be treated. So it was very nice to, for our, our field to get the attention, but at the same time, we did worry that the hopes of patients were raised unnecessarily. And, you know, we did a lot to try to, um, to explain to patients that actually this is a long-term thing. And, you know, if you think about my own case, my, cent my own centre is one of the first to be opening, and our first treatments won't be until the 15th of June. Um, so it wasn't until the 6th of May that ARCS and the British Fertility Society published a, a full guideline on the reintroduction of treatment. And we based that guideline on five key principles. The first key principle was that we should resume fertility treatments only if we could do so in a manner that would minimize the chance of spread of COVID-19 infection to patients and staff. Because as, as we've heard already from Nicholas, it is, it is extremely infectious. Uh, centers should ensure that we have a fair and transparent system of approaching prioritization. So we put a lot of emphasis on prioritizing those patients who are most needy. And we want it to be open and transparent in the way that that was done. Particularly here, we're worried about um, patients who uh, were, were old or had low ovarian reserve, et cetera, and the effect that any form of close down had had on them. We didn't want any undue burden on our National Health Service, and that remains the case. So we're continuously monitoring that, as is, as is our government and our National Health Service. And we wanted to make sure that patients were fully informed of any potential risks or indeed the lack of data available on potential risks because we felt that was very important and um, that's that's inherent to the policy is that patients should be advised we don't know what the risks are it might not be safe and if you want to delay treatment that's absolutely fine and we will advise the patients whether or not it's safe to delay in their case um, and also, finally, that we wanted the fertility sector to adopt sustainable changes in working practice that would build resilience against any future uh, surge in cases, because we're particularly worried, I'm sure colleagues across Europe are worried, about a second wave of infections that might arrive as lockdowns are lifted, etc. So in terms of key points for our guideline, a lot of it's been covered already because there's a lot of crossover with the between all of our policies, I think. But we talked a lot about social distancing for both patients and staff. So, you know, it's the two meter rule uh, in our country. Uh, video consultations and telemedicine wherever possible. Working from home, so, so it's a new concept for a lot of us, but, but we have been doing wherever possible, working from, working from home. This concept of this idea of splitting into separate teams was raised in the policy as well. And, and the issue there is it's quite difficult for smaller teams to split because you can't deliver the workload if you do that. Uh, but, but we have recommended that if it's possible, we should consider that because of the chance of cross infection. Not sharing equipment in the lab as well. So um, micro pipettas, et cetera, the, the recommendation is that we don't share them between staff that wherever possible, if staff can't wear goggles whilst under, undertaking microscopy, that they clean the, the eyepieces of the microscopes between use, because we're, we're very worried about cross-infection between teams, particularly as um, our field is so young, a lot of our team members are, are young and thus are more likely to have very, very low levels of symptoms or even be asymptomatic completely. So. We, we took a view that there was a, a, a big risk of cross-infection from staff to each other there. Um, we recommended spreading out appointments and procedures in the laboratory. So, so in our case, in my own, my own experience, we're actually doubling the time that we take to do something to begin with. And then we will see how that goes. And if we can maintain social distancing, if we can maintain safety, then we will begin to shorten the appointments. And we're also minimizing the number of appointments. So we're cutting out unnecessary scans. We're not doing as much monitoring. We're being more reliant also on, on um, stimulation regimes that will minimize the risk of OHSS. Uh, 
and we're also wearing additional PPE, so gloves, masks, and if it's feasible to do so, goggles also. So we talked a little bit about the, the possibility of cross-infection um, from semen. It may or may not be that the, that the case is, is the virus is actually in semen. We also talked about follicular fluid and the fact that we haven't found the virus in follicular fluid, but we took a view that actually quite often in a follicular aspirate, you will also get some blood. And there almost certainly is virus in blood. So we're treating the, the, the follicular fluid as if it's infectious as well. So we advise that risk assessment should be undertaken for all relevant procedures before um, beginning treatments. We wanted to ensure that equipment that may have been mothballed, so equipment that's been turned off during our close down period, that it was properly revalidated because we perceived a potential risk there if people just walk back into a lab and try to start up again. So there's a lot of emphasis on making sure that the equipment has been properly maintained and is properly revalidated if it hasn't been left on during that period, validation hasn't continued. Um, We've also restructured, recommended restructuring of the workplace. So looking at waiting rooms, minimizing the number of seats in waiting rooms, moving furniture around in consultation rooms, ensuring distance between staff and patients, and even going to the extent, um, one way this has been interpreted is, is actually asking patients to wait in the car and calling them to come into the building when you're ready for their appointment. And that, that seems to be working quite well anecdotally. We also have a triage questionnaire that seems to be quite common across across Europe, I think, in, in, in policies. And a triage questionnaire is basically your, your standard questions around temperature, around contact with people who've been infected, et cetera. And, and if people triage positive, then we're recommending that they don't come into the department. We are testing all of our patients when they have their baseline scan for treatment. And then ideally we'll be testing them again two days before they have their egg collection. Okay, so there'll be a test at a retest. And then at every single appointment, they will be telephone triaged again. And if at any time they show either a positive test or any symptoms, then if they show symptoms, they'll be they'll be re-swabbed and re-screened. Taking into account though the fact that we know there is a very high false negative rate on the screens that are currently available. Um, so they'll either be rescreened, or if they actually test positive, if they've not had an egg collection yet, they will be abandoned. If they have had their eggs collected, then they will have embryos frozen. And those embryos will be frozen in, ideally, in separate tanks. So we will have, we'll have tanks specifically for COVID patients. Um, we have asked in our policy for centres to risk assess and consider having separate tanks during this period. The issue there is if you're using a closed system, you might risk assess that actually a closed vitrification system is relatively safe. Again, if you're using vapor phase, you might risk assess that that's relatively safe. Um, whereas if you're using an open system, I guess it's a completely different story then. Uh, we talked about <coughs> reciprocal support agreements between centres. That was very important. And that's something I, don't, I haven't seen in many other policies. So, so in the UK, we, we um, through the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, we have to have a center that we have an agreement with that will support us if we have a problem. And we've been asked to, to, to renew those reciprocal agreements there. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on ensuring supply chain and consumables because our concern was that everybody around the world would open up at around about the same time and there would immediately be supply chain issues. Thankfully, that doesn't appear to be the case at the moment. I don't know if anybody's found that. Maybe we'll find out later. Um, we also talk in, in, in the UK, um, by law, we have to offer counselling to our patients. And so part of our policy deals with counselling our patients, uh, both clinical counselling and, and kind of therapeutic counselling. Um, and that's around the risks of undergoing treatments when they've got health conditions as well. So we're triaging for health conditions and we're recommending anybody with underlying health conditions, if they can, to delay treatments. We've asked our staff to sign up to a code of conduct. And that staff says that that, that code of conduct says that any member of staff who suspects they have symptoms, who comes into contact with somebody or indeed any member of staff who uh, breaks our uh, lockdown, whatever level of lockdown we have, will immediately report that and then we'll self-isolate and will not come into work. Okay. And that's that's a document they have to sign. So breaching that document would be a severe offense for their employer. 
And we've also put a lot of emphasis on staff safety and support during this period because there were a lot of concerns initially from staff, understandably, that they might be coming into contact with, with patients who were infected. In terms of, of problems that we've encountered so far, and I'd be interested to hear what people say after at the end of the meeting. We've encountered quite a few problems with sourcing personal protective equipment. So, you know, gloves, masks, goggles, etc. are in relatively short supply. And we're very, very conscious that we don't want to be taking those supplies away from critical care units, etc., where they're desperately needed. And what we didn't factor into to, to our considerations was that we actually have a shortage of some sedation drugs and, and a lot of centres in the UK will perform egg collections under sedation and those a lot of those drugs are, are the same drugs that are used for patients who are ventilated when they have COVID-19 and so that shortage of those drugs has potentially limited the amount of treatments that we can offer in the UK. Uh, currently, just over half of centres in the UK have received permission from the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority to restart treatment. It has to be said, some haven't even applied, and that's probably because their staff are still redeployed elsewhere. Um, but we hope that more centres will open in the coming weeks. The next steps for, for us as, as a society are that we're reconvening our working group. We're going out to all of our members. So we're asking our members for their opinions, we're asking them for the problems that they've encountered, and our guideline is going to be reviewed in two weeks' time. And on the basis of the input that we have from our members, for our regulator, the authority, um, we will rewrite, rewrite the guideline based on current evidence at that stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asun. Interesting presentation, and I, I guess you are live, leaving huge changes in IVF labs and teams. Okay, we will wait for the, for the end of the presentation of all other speakers to talk a little bit more. Next speaker, next speaker is Lucia De Santis, the woman of the Italian Society of Embryology, Reproduction and Research. Dr. Santis, Italy, as well as Spain, has been severely affected by the pandemic. How are you dealing with in these days? Yeah, we are, we are getting better. We are covering, although um, I come from Milano, so it's one of the hittest parts of Italy. Um, can you see my desktop? I had some problems even in getting to in the meeting at the beginning. Can you see my desktop? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So thanks for inviting me to give this brief talk on the recommencing of uh, our activity. Um, coming, going through this uh, this talk and starting from the the comment we we were. We were doing right now. Um, you see that uh, uh, most of the Italian uh, IVF centers are uh, located in the central northern part of Italy, with uh, some exception in Campania and Sicily. But uh, as you all know, uh, Lombardia, Piemonte, Emilia Romagna, and Veneto were the um, four regions uh, more severely. Uh, heated by the, the pandemic, uh, and uh, especially Lombardia, uh, the region where I work, uh, is still uh, facing with a high high number of people getting infected every day. So uh, we are um, probably um, one of, of of the sorry. 
I can manage this. Okay. It seems it works. Does it work? Because I, I, I can't see the, 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 I have no screen in this moment. We see your screen. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that. Um, so um, being one of the first countries in Europe facing with the pandemic, maybe the first one in Europe, we our lockdown started very early. So at the beginning of March, the government said, "Okay, let's go and go in uh, in lockdown." And uh, of course, uh, starting from this moment, it obviously not all the centers were able to discontinue the cycles. But by the end of March, all the um, the centers discontinued their cycles. So this is the situation. And we restarted, uh, or at least we were allowed to restart starting with May the 4th. But uh, as it was uh, already uh, common by the other colleagues, of course, uh, we needed at least one week to reassess all the laboratory and put in place all the, um, the procedures before restarting. So progressively, all the regions and centers are restarting their IVF cycles. Of course, uh, the situation that the, the disease was differently spread about the country, but the data that got the government told us we could be able, we can uh, recommence, it was it was um, generating a, a difference in in uh, in restarting in different in different regions of of Italy, of course. So no, not all the uh, northern center, not uh, northern. Um, countries, uh, northern cities has restarted their procedures yet. So um, the first recommendations were published by our society and published in a letter on human reproduction, but even the other scientific societies of reproduction in Italy in the same week, so at the, mid in the middle of March, at the middle of March, presented their, or their own recommendations. Uh, and of course, uh, the recommendations are not much different from the one already um, explained by, 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 by the previous speakers. And they are not so different from the one we are trying to apply now in the recommencing period. Uh, so the recommendations um, were, were given in the pandemic period, but uh, during this period, a lot of literatures came out. And so uh, in the, in, during April, uh, and the beginning of March, we had a lot of uh, informations, although most of them, as Anna properly said, didn't come from peer review papers. So not all of them were uh, uh, strong data or at least uh, uh, validated uh, in peer review data. Uh, so at the moment, it doesn't seem that there are evidence. So we cannot say no, but we cannot say yes, there is. Uh, there are so probably there are uh, reasonable um, reasons to be to believe that there are no um, strong risk recommencing uh, IVF treatments because in in the genital tract, although if there are the AC2 receptors present, it doesn't seem that the, the virus is present at a high concentration. Um, how to recommend? Uh, our competent authority, which is uh, the National Health System Registro PMA and uh, um, National Transplantation Center, provided the uh, guidelines not very different from the one produced by ESHRE at, at some stage, uh, not very far from the, the one produced from uh, SRM. However, um, the guideline, the, the recommendation provided by uh, our competent authorities did not go through the matter as we were expecting. So again, the scientific society made the difference. 
um, for example, in, uh, in Italy, uh, the Italian Society of Gynecology and Obstetric, and this is this is a slide kindly provided from our friend Luca Gianaroli, and um, it is uh, it is the um, the main goal is to apply the triage procedure. So as Ashre recommended, also the uh, SIGO recommended that the triage is the first first mandatory indication to provide IVF uh, treatments. But again, as I was saying before, uh, it was the scientific society that has to provide a uh, recommendation uh, to um, interpret and, uh, and uh, let the, the professionals be able to understand uh, how to manage uh, the laboratory. But as we all know, IVF is not a single discipline, is a multidisciplinary discipline. So everything we decide in the lab has uh, interactions with the other, uh, other, other person. So in our uh, recommendations, we, um, of course, indicate some mm, clinic, uh, some laboratory practice, and, but also taking in account that uh, we have to interact with all the systems. So um, in, this, uh, in this view, uh, the respect uh, of the rules, especially the social distancing is important, not only in the lab, but also uh, within uh, the staff uh, with administration, nurses, midwives, and clinicians. Um, we suggest the clinicians uh, not to enter in the laboratory, but uh, the important thing is to maintain the distancing. And as, uh, as already said, um, the, the, to wearing PPE is mandatory. Uh, in especially wearing PPE, uh, even constantly, even in some cases we were uh, used not to wear them all the time. In this case, we have we have to wear them uh, all the time, and for this reason, uh, because of because of the disease, as we, all, we 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 said many times, is extremely contagious, but also because it's um, it's a questions of respect and of um, of with it's a sort of respect for the other people in the staff. Um, since it's not always possible to maintain the distancing, or it can happen that uh, we meet in the lab mm, even for for few times, uh, wearing the PPE is important if all the staff is wearing the PPE. And being the um, the, the, the difficult to have to find in uh, especially in, in Italy, it was a very very difficult moment, the beginning of March because there was a dramatic demand of, of PPE uh, from, from other departments. Um, now that we are recommencing, it is mandatory to have the constantly provide, that, that the PPE are constantly provided. And uh, again, we, we suggested to plan a proper workflow. For example, we suggested for those staff that has uh, a number of embryologies uh, uh, that uh, make it possible a rotating schedule we decided to witnessing uh, most of the time in an online uh, way. So via WhatsApp or other uh, web system, uh, we can witness the procedure without being so close to the other colleague. And of course, this is uh, for the case that people uh, do not have a witness system. Uh, check critical equipment and um, Again, uh, what the uh, British colleague said a few, few minutes ago, it's it very important if during the lockdown, the instrumentation was stopped, we have to recalibrate um, and uh, revalidate all the instrumentation before reopening. And again, uh, uh, provide a proper media and device stock. And again, how and when clean and sanitize. Um, in our recommendations, we uh, made reference to our uh, guidelines that we um, published some years ago uh, with uh, our competent authorities. So it's not a question to do something particularly different. It's uh, very important to do it more frequently. So we have to increase the routine frequency of cleaning, pay attention and clean microscope oculars between two operators 
keyboards, telephone. Um, it's nice that uh, although we didn't phone one each other before this webinar, <laughs> uh, we are all stressing this uh, uh, point to clean microscope oculars because we know that we learned that this, this virus is extremely contagious and one of the preferred um, and enter uh, of the virus is, uh, is the eyes. So one of the symptoms is the conjunctivitis. And then uh, as a, an additional measurement for those of us who uh, um, generally um, let produce the semen in, in, the, in the center, uh, to disinfect the outside of sperm collection containers because at least in Italy, most of the center decide uh, in those cases where the distance uh, is uh, feasible to uh, ask the patient, the male, to collect semen um, um, outside the center, so at home or in a hotel if they don't uh, live uh, so close. And we uh, minimize the collections in the center. But of course, if they bring the semen outside, uh, from outside, we have to ask them to collect, uh, um, to clean, we, are, we have to collect the, this, the, the container and then clean, uh, clean very well the outside. And again, um, probably we don't have a strategy to avoid the contamination, but we have a strategy to mitigate the risk. So what we said uh, in our recommendation is, could dilution be the solution? And the answer we provided is yes. Uh, it's not new that multiple washing of gametes and embryos are effective to remove microorganisms and viral pathogens. So culture media and embryo transfer, um, applying dilution to culture media and embryo transfer is extremely important as it is extremely important uh, to provide dilution during vitrification and warming procedures. Um, what I want to stress is that sometimes in the laboratory um, we, uh, we, we interpret the dilution as um, um, enhance the volume. And what, what we stress in our procedure is that it's important to wash many times the embryos or the gametes before freezing, not uh, um, increase the volume too much because increasing the volume can affect a, a clinical uh, outcome of your of your procedure. So again, uh, how to storage? Um, I put question marks at the end of any sentence because high security straws are they necessary? Our competent authorities in the document mimic what Ashra said says yes. If you have a positive or a, or at least a high risk couple that cannot discontinue the treatment, then you have to proceed with the, with the treatment. But um, of course, uh, if every one of us is not familiar with this kind of device, it's better to use uh, your, the, the device uh, you are, you are um, familiar with and then up, um, apply a different storage system. Um, are quarantine cryotank, quarantine cryotanks necessary? If yes, should we consider SARS-CoV-2 tanks? Because this is another question. So if we started to quarantine all the samples we are producing in this uh, month, uh, we will have to add cryotanks, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in our uh, banks. Considering that, especially in Italy, that we are discovering now that probably the pandemic was starting <laughs> December 20. And in 2019 or even or January, uh, probably we performed a lot of these patients that were asymptomatic or at least with low symptoms. And then we realized they were positive. And all this, uh, uh, we have no control on this, what we call pre-pandemic period that for at least for Italy, at least for Lombardia, is a, was at, at the end a pandemic period. Uh, liquid nitrogen or vapor phase, uh, no, no one better than Spanish demonstrate that liquid nitrogen can be a vector of virus, but the, the amount of virus is not able to uh, contaminate the sample. So again, um, it, it is opportune to do what is the best in our laboratories with the 
with extreme, extreme cautions, but not with changing too much in our routine, which uh, can be less under control than, than the previous procedure. And um, what, what, uh, what I can, we can suggest uh, again is to um, reassess the activity and do all risk and a risk assessment for every single step. It is more important to do this than to change something just to apply a different approach because of the pandemic. And um, this is another recommendation for our procedure that it is a um, uh, sort of sum up of the different papers uh, uh, came uh, coming out uh, in in this uh, in this period. Um, it's it's important because uh, um, gave the impression of that there was a sort of organic response in different countries to to the same to the same problem, and this is is a good point. I think this is a very good point, and I really like um, the colleagues that said that, that maybe uh, at the end uh, we were doing very well uh, if we are able to put in place all these all these. Uh, um, procedure in a safe uh, or at least a limited uh, risk uh, fashion. So, of course, the uh, next step are what are the next scenarios? We are probably facing the scenario number one with peaks and valleys. Uh, we would like not to face, but probably we will, and we have to be prepared for the scenario number two, of course, with a fall peak. So we have to be ready to, uh, in case, uh, uh, re rebalance our our work uh, uh, our work uh, activity. And probably the scenario number three is uh, that we will reach with the herd immunity given uh, herd immunity given by the vaccination. So in short term, what uh, CIR uh, suggest to Italian embryologists is be cautious, do not panic, stay safe, take care of patient tissues, laboratory equipment, and, and colleagues. And these are the colleagues of from SIA that uh, helped me providing this uh, presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. I'm glad to know you are much better now. Hope you follow in this stage or even better. And now we move forward to the last presentation. The last speaker is Sofia Nunes, Dr. Sofia Nunes, Chairman of the Embryology Section of the Portuguese Society of Reproductive Medicine. Fortunately, Portugal has suffered much less the impact of COVID-19. How is the situation in the Portuguese IBF units and how are you working? Sofia, the audience is yours. Hello. Hello, first of all, thank you for the organizers for the invitation to be present in this uh, webinar. Well, as you said uh, before, Portuguese situation uh, hasn't been as severe as the, uh, in other countries. But, uh, of course, we, we did stop our uh, lab activities and um, we are now uh, starting to, to, to open our labs. Uh, well, actually, uh, well, we don't have, a, um, first of all, we still don't have an official recommendation for uh, reopening the labs. We will have a, a meeting next uh, next week to 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 have a concept uh, concerning this uh, opening. Uh, I don't have much to add to all recommendations. We we did a query to all clinics to see w whether they they have changed the, their 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 lab uh, um, procedures. And um, but the, well, the only thing we have we have changed was the the, um, the cleaning. The, they are cleaning more often uh, the um, well the equipment. Uh, people are wearing uh, masks uh, outside of the of the lab. Um, and uh, actually, we don't have many. Well, we are we are using Azure guidelines and NASA guidelines to to deal with our 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 work. Uh, at the lab. Um, so I, I think, well, I don't have much to add concerning, well, all the, what, what have the, the other speakers uh, have uh, talked. So I, I think it's time for discuss, discussion and uh, to see uh, whether we have more uh, suggestions. Okay. Thank you. 
Well, yeah, thank you, uh, Sophia. Thank you very much. So, um, before uh, the the question sent by the audience, I don't know if you you, you want to add anything, or you you want to send cross questions between you, the speakers. No. No. <laughs> oh, this. Uh, no, may I may I ask something? See, si, of course, please. I, I think yeah. so. Um, another thing that I want to point out is that uh, considering that the spreading of the disease in Italy was so different along the country, of course, even the the triage is applied in a different fashion among regions. For example, in Lombardia, or over um, in addition to the triage, uh, public public centers obtain to do swabs, which is, I think, extremely important. We do a swab, in, our, in my center, for example, we are lucky, we can do a swab at the beginning of simulation and one the day of induction. So they do the swab in the morning and they do the induction in the evening. So in the case, uh, it's, it's, it's still possible to manage, not to, probably not to discontinue, but at least to manage the situation, knowing in advance. And I think this is this is very helpful. But uh, I, I would like to know who is doing only the triage, or if there are countries that are putting in place uh, the swabs or the serological test. For example, as a staff, we are we were all tested for serological uh, antibodies. If I may, if I may answer. Um, the triage system, I think, is, is really good to try to detect um, the suspicious cases. In cases where uh, you have suspicion that the patient can be positive, obviously you have to use whatever test you have. Uh, PCR, obviously, to know if this patient is infectious or not. And also serology uh, is also a tool that, that, that we can use. But it depends on the availability of the tests. Um, not all centers have the, the possibility to, to have people tested. I would recommend that um, staff is also submitted to, to testing if possible. Um, and uh, well, as I said, depending on the availability of the tests, you can do one thing or the other. In any case, any suspicious case uh, with the triage has to be left out of, of, of the program. And I think this should be the recommendation. As it has been said, and Jason also uh, mentioned that, we don't know really what are the consequences of this um, infectious disease uh, in the initial stages of the pregnancy. Um, it has been said that um, maybe thromboembolic events happening in severe cases can, might cause uh, miscarriage or might cause any other problem during the initial phases of the pregnancies. And I think that uh, this, this has to be avoided whenever, whenever possible. Well, here, for, for example, we, we had so less uh, short uh, contact with the virus that uh, doing serological tests to all the all our coll collaborators is, it's, uh, I think it's no point. You know, sure, yes, depending course. on what's the prevalence of the virus in your country, uh, obviously, yeah. if you have very minor um, prevalence, uh, then it's it's useless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say in Spain, yeah. I would say that most private clinics are doing some kind of testing at the, during the triage, well, after a negative triage, and, and also before retrieval and or transfer. But it's, uh, it's not that common, I would say, in the public health system because they are inside big hospitals and there are other rules and there are priorities for testing patients who have symptoms. So it's not, I would say, not, not everybody's testing. It's like, like you said, Anna, who has the test available, <laughs> they're using it, but not, it's not available to all clinics. That's why it's not universal, I would say, in Spain. Who can test, they are testing. The staff, and, and the patients. But on the other hand, uh, my feeling is that we are finding the 
the now after these two, three weeks after we have started, the prevalence, the incidence of the people who have been exposed or the people who are uh, infected that are starting or they are coming to a clinic lower than what we supposed at the beginning. And I, I hopefully it will become even lower. So so I, I would think that at some point the next month, <laughs> we, we I hope that we start talking about when to stop testing because mm, the incident is so low that only with triage or only with this uh, locating people and the people who have been exposed, like these uh, small outbreaks localized actually by the epidemiologic people of each community. So maybe the scenario will be different in one month, maybe two months time. Lucia? No, I, I really appreciate what Nicolas said when he said, even if you are negative, don't use it to be um, lazy or to consider it because this is very this is very important we have to keep the guard the guard up because probably we will have a second uh, peak okay. and in any case once if we acquired a safer way to work that as i said it was i think it was high in any in any case because i i am proud i think we embryologists work very very well uh, with a very high level of attention, risk assessment. Uh, but uh, if you know that you are negative, this is not an excusation to to be lazy or to uh, maintain a different attitude. But of course, we are even in this this morning in the lab we were talking about we are expecting the time not to test because the triage is enough. Yes, on. You have to... Yes, I think um, in, in the UK, we, we are testing our patients and we're testing them about 12 to 14 days before they have their eggs collected. And we're also advising they're tested just before the collection as well. We talked about staff testing and, and what the group felt was that the tests at the moment, at the time we wrote the, 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 the policy, there, there wasn't really a serological test that had been approved in the UK for use. And so we were stuck with PCR. And the false negative rate on a PCR test is, is is very high. You know, it could be as high as 30%. So the decision was, and also there was a, there, there weren't, there was a, a problem with availability of testing. And so we made the decision not to test staff, but any, any member of staff who is symptomatic doesn't come into work and is tested at that stage. Uh, and, and that's policy across the health service as well. So any health service staff who are symptomatic are tested, or even if any any member of their household is symptomatic, they're tested. But I, I'm interested to know what the other panelists think about this idea of you, you may test a member of staff today and they'll be negative. Tomorrow they may acquire the virus. You know, so so how often would you test? You know, that's the question I would ask. What depending on depending on the risk of of these people. Sorry. And uh, as you said, the code of conduct is something really important. You have to to, to educate uh, staff if you are in a in a high prevalence uh, region that they have to keep distances. They don't have to go I don't know shopping every day or things like that to try to avoid the possibility of getting uh, of getting infected. Depending on each clinic, uh, testing can be done every week. I would say that maybe. Um, uh, PCR could could be uh, an option if those people have symptoms, but if not, uh, doing serological tests also gives you a lot of information. And if you have people that have already uh, been exposed to the virus and have already uh, developed immunity, those people are kind of safe uh, uh, and, uh, and you can avoid uh, testing them um, in the future, so so the combination of the of the two tests, the, the PCR and the serological test, even considering that there is uh, some um, possibility of failure in both of them, uh, the combination of the two is what gives you a, a good idea of what you are facing as possibility of of infection in your staff. Okay. Uh, before 
um, answering questions from the audience. Nicolás has presented the main the highlights of our document. How can we improve it? Or in another way, is there anything that has caught your attention or especially your attention? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Everything can be improved. Uh, of course. But, of course. <laughs> What we are working is a little bit more. What we are working in each in each version a little bit more details. So maybe some of the uh, specific ideas or some of the details I may have heard from Lucia or from Jason. Maybe some might can be added, but there I would say that they are mostly details explaining. In depth, what we propose, but I think in the end we are working a very similar, in a very similar way. Uh, it's with the philosophy behind how we work is the same uh, in all our labs. So I think there's been nothing especially. There's nothing like a, a thing that we haven't seen. Oh, this is must be introduced in the next paper. There are details that maybe that. Uh, have insisted in to be exposed by Jason, or maybe we can we can detail better in our document. But I think that the spirit is the same in all the different countries, you know, from all the different societies. Okay. So, my something uh, I mean, as Lucia has pointed out, the work, the methodology that we use in the lab is is strict enough. We are used to work uh, in very strict conditions. We work in a lab, we have to avoid contamination. And also, we need, even we are not uh, virologists and we are not experts in, in that field. We are scientists. So we need to apply common sense and our knowledge to try to behave in the lab in this situation. So I understand that maybe SOPs or people uh, ask very specific questions about certain things, but at the end, we should expect that, that people, um, lab directors and embryologists in the lab know how to behave and how to, how to use the methodology in the lab to avoid, uh, to avoid uh, infection um, being spread, so. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that uh, sorry, now, now I think my, my, my concern is about uh, the people that, uh, well, our collaborators, you know, it's like the, the contamination between people that are working the, within the staff, right? Because the, the lab is already taken care of, uh, well, the procedures are very, well, uh, secure, so I think it's an important thing. <laughs> okay, if you agree, um, move ahead from... Question from the audience, from the participants. Most, some of the questions are open. So there are no, no specific uh, speaker for answering them. So the first is, well, would you recommend PCR for all male patients providing a semen sample? Please. If I may say, I have said that already. If you do a proper triage, then you don't have to test everybody unless you have the availability and um, the resources to, to test everyone. The ideal situation would be to test everybody before not only the patients, but also the staff and frequently enough to try to avoid completely the risk. But this, is, this would be the ideal situation. So um, probably with the use of the triage, you can avoid um, some of the PCR tests uh, in, 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 your, in, in the hospitals. But in any case, private centers, as this has been said by, by Nicolas, are using PCR 14 days before um, uh, at, the, at the initial phase of the ovarian stimulation and then just before just before um, the trigger. So, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. How to detect positive people with triage in, uh, sorry, in asymptomatic condition? 
<laughs> you don't detect them. So, yeah. With that triage, you're going to have a low proportion of people who are asymptomatic but infected. That's true. But it's a low proportion. And people who are asymptomatic, they are less, they may be, depending on the phase, but um, let's say there were many people will be maybe in the late stages and they are less infectious than people who are with acute uh, an acute infection. So they may be infected, uh, but the proportion is low. And maybe they are not as infective as people in, with symptoms. Yeah, and I think that just underlines the importance of treating everybody as if they are positive. If we use universal precautions with every patient, then the asymptomatics shouldn't be a problem, really, should they? Yeah. I think that the problem, I think the problem is with the symptomatic is not as much as in the lab, because we work in a usually a level two containment. We we only we're only talking about making it higher or standards of PPEs. It's more the movement of the patients in the clinic, the operating room, and the contact of the patient with the people in the clinic. I think that's what has changed a lot. It hasn't changed that much inside the lab, from the doors inside, than how you move around the clinic, the, the patients, the risk, because the risk is from person to person. It's not the samples where the risk is. What well, the risk may be, but not as much as with the people. In this context, we have I, another que a question. During the closure of borders and in, the, in front of the impossibility of patients to travel, what do you think about the risk of transport of gametes, embryos between centers in, in the, in, in, inside the, the one region or in internationally? <laughs> Okay, if I, I would say that first the risk is lower because we are talking about washed samples. They are oocytes, maybe sperm, maybe the people, the the the, the patients have come through a triage or even a PCR serological test. So they are they, we are not talking about high risk samples. And the second thing is, it's true that people maybe the border are closed for people, but are closed, but they are open not only for samples, but all for any parcel. We can send uh, anything from one part to the other. So they, and they are not sanitized or clean. So I would say that from a epidemiological contagious point of view, that's okay. Moving around uh, samples from one country to the other because. Uh, in the end, the patient must go to to that clinic. So it will be, she will be storing for six months the samples there for two months. So I, first, I don't think it's a health risk, and uh, and I don't think it's going to be a big issue right now. The samples are going to stay. There's no need to move samples around right now. So I don't feel it's an issue. Maybe maybe this situation, this pandemic, will change things. It will change things, for example, with telemedicine. In some cases, patients will not travel from one place to the other. They will communicate with their doctors through video conferences, for example. And also, this solution of sending the samples, um, not the patients moving from one country to another, will be adopted. Imagine, for example, in all site donation programs, if you send a sample from, from, uh, from the mail to the place where the donation is going to take place, the all sites are recovered, the embryos are obtained, they are frozen, vitrified, and then they are sent to the patient, obviously through a doctor who will carry the, the, the transfer. I don't know, probably, this this pandemic will change many things, apart from changing also the fact that probably we will not have um, so many uh, congresses. We will not travel around to deliver our talks. We will be delivering our talks uh, like this. Uh, we will save money. We will avoid uh, contamination with the airplanes. So uh, if we if we take the opportunity to learn some lessons from um, from this pandemic. Uh, I think I, it will be the only good thing uh, that we can take home. Uh, 
from this. If I may, from yes. a, a practical point of view, we it's not in the recommendation uh, pay, the recommendation paper we produce as a seer, but uh, we are uh, suggesting some colleagues that are asking us these questions. We are doing a sort of um, filter. Uh, between the lab and the outside where we are doing uh, the transportation procedure for example the courier arrives we and we we if you have the room you can do it even a small place where you can identify samples do the and transfer in a small um, container of liquid nitrogen and then you enter the lab with your samples without letting the it's a sort of filter, but it helps to avoid the courier to enter. So you don't have to do the triage to him uh, to measure the temperature, even if, for example, in big hospitals now the thermal scanner are at the, at the entrance, so everybody is scanned. But and this is, a, um, is an easy way. You can go in the filter with your colleague, with your witness, do the identi identification of the sample, and so the courier and the container that travel didn't enter your lab. And so you don't have to put in place the procedure to sanitize the, the shipping uh, container you have to, otherwise you have to, to enter in the lab. Next question. In small units with conventional liquid nitrogen tanks, and with uh, little availability uh, to um, other tanks, should acquire a new tank to store frozen samples of either embryos, oocytes, semen, or testes. Uh, even asymptomatic pa patients with negative tests need isolated tanks. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> I would say and that through liquid nitrogen has never been proved, not even with other viruses. So at the end, um, we need to be aware of the possible risk, but the way we work uh, and the experience we have from previous um, exposure to other viruses makes things uh, relatively safe. So I don't think we should store samples and then if you have treated a, a positive patient and you don't know that she has been positive and you have already the straws in your liquid nitrogen together with the other samples, what are you going to do? Are you going to go back to all the patients that you have treated since when? Since December 2019? Before? All of them? All, uh, I mean, I, I think this is, the risk is almost close to zero transmission in liquid nitrogen. And uh, I would say that we, we need to, to apply common sense to what we do in the lab. Yes, I agree. You agree? Okay, next, next. There are several questions about the dilemma or not between uh, closed devices, open devices for preservation of embryos, no sites. What is your opinion? Uh, may I? Yeah, as, I as I stress in my presentation, first of all, we don't know what we did before the pandemic was declared. That was the beginning of March. But what was before? For example, mm -hmm. in Italy, probably December, January, and uh, we use uh, open devices uh, m most of the time. Um, it is more uh, dangerous to use something you never used and you're not familiar than to use something you know very well that will not affect the clinical outcome and use it in, with good sense. So if you, if you are sure that the, post, the patient is positive or is highly um, in a high risk uh, ratio, you can uh, uh, use the closed system or evaluate the possibility of a separate tank. Then oh, we have lost your... Voice. Can you hear no. me now? Yes. You, you heard that what I said before. Yes. Okay. So, Not the last one. <laughs> uh, 
so if, if you have uh, um, a patient that for sure is positive or is at high risk, you can put it in a tank that from that moment becomes the COVID tank, of course. Uh, I, I, otherwise, you, you have to continue to use what you are familiar. Uh, otherwise, I think the clinical outcome, we are IVF specialists. So the clinical outcome, it, it has to be maintained uh, as it was. So the, the, the standards has to be maintained for, for our patients. Okay. Us? Uh, yes, that's something that we are right now um, uh, discussing right now in the in the Aseviers Spanish Society Fertility Task Group because what COVID, uh, this pandemic is, I think, uh, it's been useful for also is analyzing what we have been doing, what we should have been doing up to now, and maybe we've been relaxing a little bit some things. And something we've been discussing with the people from cryopreservation uh, work group, is that it's not the same uh, freezing all sites or uh, capacitated sperm or, or embryos which have been diluted in the lab where you are with the risk of viral uh, particles from COVID or wherever any asymptomatic patient is very, very low. So we make it still work as we've been doing up to now as with uh, specimens that are uh, direct fluids from the body. So discussing what we should do with big tissues, big pieces of big, they're small, but for us it's, they're big, like uh, 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 ovarian cortex or pieces of testicle, the same can be applied to, to, the, to the semen, to the ejaculate. The ejaculate is not clean. It's, uh, it's dirty, it has its own bacterial flora. So it may be contaminated with things. So something that we are thinking is that we should maybe, not because of COVID, but in general, uh, recommend that in the case of uh, cryopreserving uh, semen, the semen ejaculate, we should use uh, safety straws and maybe the other kind of containers, may, uh, you can use them if you, they are already washed, if it's a capaci capacitated uh, sperm. But if you are using with a direct body tissue, maybe you should working with uh, either safety straws or vapor phase tanks or independent, independent tanks, especially when you are, and of course, when you are working with patients which are positive. But the only change we are thinking after COVID in our general standards is in the case of uh, zimming, in the case of when you are freezing direct ejaculate, because we are working for a direct body fluid. And especially in the ejaculate case, it's full of its own flora and it can be, it can be, it can have infectious germs. This is not the this is not the case of Italy where the for for storage of semen we have to it's our competent yes. authorities that oblige us to call to, it's to not, use the, the it's the, not compulsory still in Spain but we think that maybe it's time to to recommend it as a good practice. It may be the last question. Uh, in case of OHSS and COVID positive high risk situation. How do you proceed? Is egg freezing a good option? Do you understand the question or? Yeah, I think I, I would recommend avoiding egg, egg freezing if at all possible. If, if you've got a partner, why not make embryos and, and, and freeze those instead? Uh, I think if the patient is positive, then, then you should consider not if you not know that before you could, you could consider not treating you know because provided they're not 40 years old they can probably afford to come back again another time when they're better okay do you do you want to to say another any more comments no we are running out of time uh let me finish by Thanking all the participants and obviously all of you speakers for your participation. It has been a long, a long webinar. Uh, a great job. I hope 
it will be useful for all of you. Thank you, thank you very much. Take care, stay safe, <laughs> and hope we will meet soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.